Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Joan Woodward, and I'm honored to lead the Travelers Institute, which, as you all know, is the public policy division and educational arm of Travelers. Welcome to our Wednesdays with Woodward webinar series, where we convene leading experts for conversations about today's biggest challenges, both personal and professional. So before we get started, I'd like to share our disclaimer about today's program. I'd also like to thank our webinar partners today, the Metro Hartford Alliance, the Insurance Association of Connecticut, the Masters in FinTech program at the University of Connecticut School of Business, and the Connecticut Business and Industry Association. Thank you all for being with us and welcome to your employees and your partners. Now on to our program. Chances are you've got a tool from a Stanley Black & Decker in your garage or in your kitchen Headquartered in the United States, Stanley Black & Decker is the world's largest US-based US tool company with revenues of $15.6 billion. The 180-year-old company employs more than 50,000 employees globally who produce and power the hand tools we all recognize as well-engineered fasteners and other industrial equipment that go into major infrastructure projects and even into our cell phones. The company's iconic brands include DeWalt, Black & Decker, Craftsman, Stanley, Cub Cadet, Hustler, and Troy Built. That's a lot. So today we're gonna to take a deep dive into this iconic company, find out their secret sauce for their amazing success over the years. How did they navigate the pandemic, dealing with supply chain issues and now inflation? The global manufacturing company is led by president and CEO, Donald Allen Jr., who is joining me today on our program. Don became the CEO, in July of 2022, after serving as the company's president and CFO, he's been with Stanley Black & Decker since 1999. Prior, his, prior to his time with Stanley Black & Decker, he was with Lowsight Corporation and Ernst & Young. Don has a bachelor's degree from the University of Hartford, right in Traveler's Backyard. And just yesterday, Don was elected chairman of the University of Hartford Board of Directors. So welcome, Don. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Joan. It's great to be here with everybody. All right. So before we get started, I wanted to see how much our audience knows about Stanley Black & Decker. I may have given some of this away already, but um, let's go to the audience quiz. So the question for my audience, and everyone please answer, it's obviously anonymous. Which of these things does Stanley Black & Decker produce? What do they manufacture in your view, knowing what you know about them today? Let's see what our audience is saying. They're all thinking, Aud audience questions, answers are coming in. Tools for astronauts, okay, parts for cars, parts for cell phones, all of the above. So Donald looks like we have 89% of the audience, I think I might have given some of this away, uh, saying that they you produce all of the things above. True? That is true. Outstanding. What? Wow. So we want to get into the tools for astronauts, the parts for car, the, you know, personal cocktail makers. I mean, this is a plethora of, of items. But you've been with Stanley Black & Decker for more than 20 years now. What are the biggest changes and challenges you have seen during your tenure? Well, again, thank you, Joan, for inviting me to this forum. I really do appreciate the opportunity to spend time with all of you and, and get you to learn more about Stanley Black & Decker and the journey that we've been on, but just as importantly, the journey we want to go on in the future over the next you know, several decades. And I think a lot of you are aware that Stanley Black & Decker has been around for a very long time. And they were two separate companies until about 12 years ago when they merged. And so Stanley was formed in 1843. Black & Decker was formed in the, the later 1800s. And, um, you know, we have amazing legacies of tools and products that they provide to the construction industry, the industrial manufacturing industry and other major manufacturers across the globe. And 
I have been fortunate enough to be with the company for uh, 24 years. Actually, this past Monday was my 24th anniversary at Stanley Black & Decker. And um, it's been a wonderful journey that we've been on. It's been full of amazing ups and it's been full of a lot of challenges. And we, I've seen uh, two or three different recessions. I saw the Great Recession back in 2008 and 2009. Like all of you, we went through a pandemic over the last three years and trying to um, navigate that. In a company that has been very resilient and very strong for a long, long time, close to 200 years, you know, it really has been put to the test. And so when I think about the biggest challenges that we've experienced, it, it varies because when I look at the 24 years that I've been here, you know, back in the Great Recession, we were all worried about where the world was going and we had to make a lot of challenging decisions. And uh, ultimately, we decided to merge with Black & Decker about a year after that recession and, and, and really created a much stronger company that we have been for the last 12 years. And then the pandemic comes along and massive, massive supply chain issues, supply chain issues that we had never seen in the past. And for a company like us who has long supply chains, and what we mean by that is we make certain products in other parts of the world that we bring into the US and we bring into Europe. So about 50% of what we sell in the United States gets made in the United States. But there's another 50% that's made in different parts of the world like Mexico, Asia, et cetera, that have much longer lead times to get our product in. And when we couldn't find enough semiconductors to go in our power tools, we were looking for more lithium ion battery cells that would go into the battery packs that attach to our power tools. You know, like many manufacturing companies, it was an intense period of time of really trying to find enough products, parts, and components to manufacture and create the products that we sell to end users and our big customers like Home Depot and Lowe's. And then the logistical aspect of just moving things around the world during the pandemic was incredibly challenging as well. So I say there's a lot of challenges that I've experienced, but I have to say the last three years were, were, were definitely probably the most significant amount of challenge ever experienced uh, by me in my career, but may have been the biggest challenge this company ever experienced in its entire history. I don't know for sure because there, there obviously was the pandemic about a hundred years ago as well that the company had to navigate at that time, but I had a hunch the supply chain wasn't quite as complicated a hundred years ago as it is today. Yeah. Wow. We, uh, I, I interviewed Karen Lynch, the CEO of CVS Healthcare, uh, a few months back. And um, as a CEO, I can't imagine what it's like running the kinds of companies that you and her were running during the pandemic with the supply chain and just, just the employee engagement and getting employees to come back to work. We're going to talk about all that, but I, yeah. I want to talk about something you talk about, which is organizational change. And you're saying you want to be a more simplified organization in a world that's so complex that you just said it was so complex. How do you talk about simplifying your organization and why do you feel like there's, there's a need to make this shift? Yeah, I think that, you know, over the last two decades, we we've created a really impressive, strong company. And by a lot of people on the leadership team, we've had two previous CEOs who guided us on that journey. I was the CFO for a large part of that time and a lot of other senior leaders in the company. And we, a lot of the brands that you mentioned in your introduction were acquisitions that we did along the way, such as the Craftsman brand as an example, or Cub Cadet, um, another example that we acquired these brands along the way to build what we are today, which is the number one tools an outdoor product company in the world. At the same time, we had other parts of our company that people don't hear as much about that provide some of those components and parts and cell phones um, as part of that question that was asked at the beginning. Uh, we have a Black & Decker brand that is actually a very appliance-oriented brand and things like cocktail making machines and um, vacuums and other types of products, toasters, et cetera are all part of that brand that many people know about, but we, you know, people tend to focus more on the tools part of our company. And as we've built this company and we've done acquisitions and grown organically, we created a very complex portfolio of businesses. And 
you may not be aware that we actually had a commercial security business for a period of time that we sold about a year ago that um, was basically a, a very similar to a company like an ADT where um, we would provide security services to a large commercial building. And so like the Travelers headquarters in, in Hartford, Connecticut, you know, we would provide the security um, in that particular building. And that would be a, putting in cameras, putting in wiring, putting in alarm systems. And then we'd also do the monitoring of that as well on an ongoing basis. Um, that was a business we built from almost scratch. And then we decided about a year ago that we were maybe becoming too much, too complex of a company. And we wanted to get back to some of the, the core basic things that make Stanley Black & Decker really successful, which is primarily tools and outdoor products. And we made that decision. We decided to sell our security business, which we did do, and that did close in the summer of last year. And we'll continue to focus on being a simpler set of portfolio of businesses. But what comes along with acquisitions sometimes is your processes, your systems, your organization structures, they get very complex. And as you get bigger, you also see that bureaucratic processes and steps begin to seep into the culture of the company, which really slows down your ability to respond and, and be resilient and be agile. And as I was looking at the company and, and the board was talking about me becoming the next CEO, I was very passionate about the fact that we need to simplify this company. You know, we're going to sell our security business. We might sell other businesses in the future. We'll see. But we're going to get back to being a tools and outdoor business. And we're going to get back to doing things in a more focused, prioritized way that will allow us to gain market share, improve the profitability of the business, generate strong cash flow, and return value to our shareholders and other stakeholders, such as our employees. And it actually, I wasn't sure how it would resonate with the team and our, our 50 plus thousand employees, but it turned out to be a very refreshing perspective because I think most people recognize how complex we have become. And so it's easy for me to say, let's go simplify. But then it becomes how exactly are you going to simplify the organization? So we put forth some pillars of focus. One is how do we make our supply chain more focused and closer to our customers? And so the length of the lead time is re reduced dramatically, which means we'll move more manufacturing into the United States, more manufacturing into the European region as well to serve those markets. We'll also be focused on reducing the number of, of SKUs that we sell. So when you do acquisitions, you can build a set of products and what we call SKUs, which is basically an individual product, like a screwdriver or a power drill. And suddenly we had 150,000 SKUs across our company. And we should probably have more like 50 to 60,000 SKUs, maybe 80,000. And so we're going through a simplification of the portfolio of the products that we sell as well. And that helps simplify your supply chain. We're also looking at all our functions and how they, they do their jobs in finance, IT, HR, engineering, marketing, and doing things in a more simplified fashion where instead of it taking 10 steps, maybe it takes six or seven steps to do. And it's been a refreshing um, mantra for our company that we've been focused on, but it's not easy. It takes time and there's no simple fix that you're suddenly three, six months later, it's all behind you. It's gonna take three to four years to really do this, but it's gonna make us a more agile and resilient company, which is really what we all need to have in today's world because if you just think about the volatility of the world and our ability to respond and be agile and be resilient, it's becoming more and more a necessity for a company to be successful to navigate these challenging times. Yeah, I think anytime you uh, just, it, it resonated with me because anytime uh, a leader in my organization would come to me and say, let's simplify and, and reduce inefficiencies in our processes, I mean, that's really welcome news to employees because- right. 
you know, you can get frustrated with the complexities and inefficiencies, as you just said. So, but it's hard, as you, as you also said, it's very hard. Right. And, and yeah. so luckily your culture has welcomed that um, leadership in the sim simplification uh, realm, but also you talked about diversification of your product, your physical product, you can touch and feel. And obviously um, that has led to your great success as well. So let me just ask you this question then, can you define your leadership credo? Like if you had to say one or two things about how you, you just talked about working with a board to sell the idea of simplifying in a very complex company, um, what what do you say your leadership style is? Yeah, I think, you know, there's probably four or five things that I try to exhibit in my leadership, you know, every day. And I, the first thing that I tend to start with is that I really believe in, in a world of business, you should have passion, you should be highly motivated, but you should be calm. And there shouldn't be drama in the, into, in the system. You really should be focused. You should be excited about what you're doing, but you should be calm in the thought process and your decision-making because unnecessary drama and emotions do kind of distract your organization. And, and it can result in people running to the right when you don't really want them to run to the right. You want them to stay the course in the middle. And I think that common presence is really important. And it also does exhibit that you're confident in your point of view that you're presenting to people because you're presenting it in a way that has some passion to it, but it's done in, in a calm way. The other thing that I believe in is being very transparent. And transparency is a word that's easy to say, but it's not always easy to live. And because sometimes when you're being transparent, you're delivering challenging news or challenging message. But what I found, and I've learned this over time, I wasn't always this way, is that when you're not transparent, it actually makes it more challenging. And the person, you're not, you're not doing that person any justice by not delivering a balanced, transparent message. Just like I expect people to be transparent with me, if they're worried about something in the company, they're concerned about something, I would expect them have no hesitation to come talk to me and, and, and our leadership team about what that concern is. But it doesn't always work that way because people are concerned that oh, how are they going to react if we bring some bad news to them? Um, will they handle it the right way? Will they, will they criticize me or us as a result of that? But it, that's a cultural thing that I've really pushed hard through my leadership style. And as people see that there is no overreaction, it's just okay, we have a problem. Let's figure out how to solve it. What are we going to do about it? What are our options? Let's discuss them. And then let's make a decision. And then the last thing I'd say is listening and being respectful to people is really important. As a leader, obviously respect is incredibly important. But listening is sometimes hard for senior leaders to do because they usually have a very strong point of view. And you can listen by just sitting there and not saying anything as the person talks, but I mean really listening. Like, what is the person saying to you? Because sometimes people deliver a message that is not as direct as maybe the way I am direct to people, and you have to interpret what they might be saying to you. Um, other times, the message is very direct, and you know exactly what what the message is. But I I, I really believe that listening is a, is an art. It's hard for people to figure out how to do it effectively. And it, sometimes it requires listening and then processing after the fact and saying, okay, what exactly was that message that I got? Is it as clear as it, it sounded or is there something underneath that? And it, it may require follow-up and discussion. And I think if when leaders fall in the trap of not listening is when they start to lose touch with what's actually happening in the company. Well, I've just learned a big lesson because I have a hard time listening sometimes too. And so I you just checked my uh, my own personal leadership style. And it's true. Sometimes you have to meet people where they are because not everyone is as direct as maybe you and I are and in, in right. what we, you know, what words we come out of our mouth. So meeting people where we are and really listening to them. I I really love love what you just said. And the transparency uh also is very important. We have a little a uh, theme here at Travelers, if you're going to fail, fail fast, right? Fail fast, right. learn from your mistakes and pivot. And so we do a lot of test and learning, as I'm sure you do too. And so empowering those employees to come to you with honest feedback 
of whether something worked or didn't work. So I really love that. Um, what has been your kind of your biggest leadership lesson along the way? And maybe what advice would you have for emerging leaders um, in your company? Yeah, I, I would say that um, one of the, I've been asked this question a lot in a lot of different settings. And, and my answer tends to be pretty narrowly focused. Um, there's a lot of things you can do and learn to be a better leader, but in a better performer in an organization, a better team member. But with my experience, one of the things that I always have found is when, when you put yourself in what I call uncomfortable situations, which is a stretch type situation where there's, a, there's an opportunity to solve a problem. And if you volunteer to go lead an effort to solve that problem, even though you may only have 10% of the solution in your mind, and you're going into something that you've never done before that could be very challenging, stretching yourself into that and stretching your capabilities and your experiences is incredibly important to make you, make you a broader leader, a broader individual. Um, and some examples of that in my own career is that, you know, I had opportunities to do certain roles overseas and I did them in different ways such as a European CFO role, a South American CFO role. And it's some of the biggest learning experiences that I had as a finance individual at that stage in my finance career. But it actually also helped me learn how to work with different cultures, how every, every country's culture is a little bit different and what motivates them, what excites them is a little bit different. And, and how you communicate has to be a little bit different. And so when you have those types of broadening experiences in a country where you don't speak the language, like an example of I was in Brazil and I don't speak Portuguese, um, you try to navigate that when you're, you're talking with people where their primary language is Portuguese and their secondary language is English. And you're trying to have an effective set of ability to communicate and you have to really figure out how you motivate and inspire them. Those types of experiences are invaluable and you don't, you don't necessarily at the time recognize how much you're learning and how much it's going to help you become whatever you want to strive towards in the future. But then you reflect on it later on and you realize, my goodness, that was probably one of the most broadening experiences I've ever had. And it helped accelerate my progression in my career because I stretched myself into a, a pretty uncomfortable zone for a period of time. Actually, that's one of my biggest pieces of advice to young people is take a risk on yourself yeah. and don't assume that you're not, you know, you're going to fail at it. Just take a risk because you don't have to have every ingredient that might be on that position description in the, in, you know, immediately, but right. getting in there and learning as you go. So that that's great advice. Okay. Yeah. We're going to dr drill down on the manufacturing challenges. Let's get into your business. So yeah. you said you have over 50,000 employees globally. Uh, what are the biggest challenges, uh, right? You talked about Brazil. Um, wh what are the biggest challenges now in the global manufacturing business? Well, I think, you know, the biggest challenge we're dealing with that is tied to the supply chain that I was describing earlier. And, um, it's also just, you know, navigating a very volatile world where you, you have to be looking at what's happening in different parts of the world that might affect your manufacturing in a, in a country like Thailand, as an example, where, you know, Thailand, you know, makes a large chunk of our tape measures that we sell, you know, in, across the globe. You know, we have a tape measure plant in New Britain, Connecticut, that makes the other significant portion of it. But about half is made there and about half is made in Thailand. And, you know, what's made in New Britain feeds primarily the U.S. market and what's made in Thailand, you know, feeds the remainder of the world. And, you know, you have to be cognizant of what's happening in that country as well as fix the other countries that we have facilities and employees at and you have to navigate through. And I, and I actually think that manufacturing um, is an area that we all are talking about getting more manufacturing back to the United States some of it back to the European markets to serve Europe. But it's not as simple as just saying that because of the, the things that have been done in the manufacturing space for the last 40, 50 years, where a lot of the US manufacturing and European manufacturing migrated to Asian countries with a heavy weighting to China. And 
And so what also happened at the same time is all the suppliers that, that actually produce components and parts to our manufacturing locations, they also migrated to those countries. And so when it's easy for me to say, hey, I wanna, for some of our Black & Decker products that we now manufacture in China, I wanna manufacture that here in North America. Let's make that change. And the cost differential has become less and less as costs in China rise and um, over time and the freight costs become higher and expensive and you can, you can minimize that as you move the manufacturing. But what makes it complex is not so much the plant that we create in North America that will assemble the products, it's that whole vendor supply base that feeds the plant that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world other than Asia. And so you have to work with your suppliers to help migrate, you know, some of their business to other parts of the world as you move your manufacturing operation. So it's a very complex thing to do, but it's a necessary thing to do, because as I said earlier in my first set of comments, we have to find a way to get closer to our customer and how we manufacture and have the ability to meet their needs in a shorter cycle. And I'll give you an example of, you know, we have customers like a Home Depot who's a fantastic customer, but when they put an order in our system, they want it in their distribution center in 24 hours. So think about that. You know, there's things that you order on Amazon that you don't even get delivered in 24 hours. And so for a set of power tools, like the wall brand of power tools, they're saying, okay, if I order 10,000 of those tools, I expect them to be in my DCs within 24 hours. Our current network is not really built to serve that effectively today. So instead it might take two days versus one day. And so we have to change our network of distribution, getting our manufacturing closer to our customers to serve that need. And as a result, you know, there has to be some radical changes to our supply chain. And so we've launched a major transformation of supply chain, as I said earlier, it will be it will be beneficial from a cost point of view. It will reduce our cost by about a billion five, which is significant. It'll allow us to take some of those savings, about 500 million of it, and reinvest in some front end user activation activities, more feet on the street selling our products, more digital marketing investments, and other types of brand um, investments as well. But it's a major, major initiative that'll happen over the next three years. But it's necessary because as we reduce the complexity of the portfolio, we, be, we get much more strategic in how we source things from that supply base I was describing. And of course, there'll be some facility optimization that we do and, and ultimately other things of excellence in that area. It, it is a necessary change for, for us to do that. And then What's interesting about it, which is the next question you're gonna ask me, Joan, is we have to have enough employees in the United States to actually be able to manufacture these products as we bring them back. And, and that is turning out to be quite a challenge. Yeah, let's talk about the labor market because um, you know Jay Timmons, the head of the National Association of Manufacturers recently said, there are millions of people ready to work in the US and manufacturers have hundreds of thousands of unfilled jobs. I think today there's 11 million job openings in the United States. Yeah. Uh, and that's a real challenge. Even in the insurance industry, we, you know, during the pandemic, I think people rethought their lives and what they wanted to do with their lives. And so there's been a disruption of the labor market. Of course, we've had immigration policies that don't allow for a lot of immigrants coming yes. to do some of these jobs. But what are you doing specifically to help fill that labor gap? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a real issue. You, you just gave some really good statistics. And, you know, there's, there's projections out there that there's probably a need for about 5 million to 6 million more manufacturing jobs by 2030. And as more companies like us begin to migrate more manufacturing back into the United States. And I, I, I've talked to Jay and he's made those comments, but at the same time, there's not a million, there's not millions of people sitting out there just waiting to be given a manufacturing job. There's a lot of people that are out there working in a lot of different industries doing different things that provide them a lot of flexibility. There's people doing things like DoorDash, Uber, um, all these other types of activities that 
you know, allow them to create certain levels of income um, to maybe give them more flexibility in, in what they're trying to do in their particular life. And I think in manufacturing, we have to really look at this from two different angles. One, I do think we need to solve the immigration situation where we have appropriate regulation around immigration, but we allow immigration to happen. We need, we need more people coming into this country that can take advantage to the, of the wonderful things that happen in the United States and eventually being becoming a US citizen. Um, it's, it's a realistic issue. We have an aging population, um, which you know we're part of that. We're part of the aging group, but we don't have as much people coming into the workforce going forward. We're gonna need immigration to really allow that to happen in some way, shape or form. And, um, I just think we need to figure out what the right process is to ensure that we do it in, a, in an appropriate way. But the other thing is, what do we do to really get people more attractive to the manufacturing sector? And, you know, so companies like us have been working with governments, local governments, um, local universities and colleges and local trade schools to begin to focus on how do we invest in our younger generation so that they understand from our perspective at Stanley Black & Decker, two different things. One is the manufacturing job opportunity. The other is maybe a trade skill opportunity where mm -hmm. maybe they wanna become a plumber or they wanna become a construction worker. And how would they do that? What's the value of that? Um, what, you know, potentially learn about our tools and get them invested in trade schools uh, versus, you know, it's great for us to be pursuing other areas like data analytics and artificial intelligence. Those are all things we need too, but we also need folks that are, are going to want to educate themselves in these particular areas. And so we're investing in that and we're actually working with the business roundtable um, to do that. We kicked off an initiative about three weeks ago at the Connecticut Science Center where uh, several of our university leaders were there. Um, you know, Governor Lamont was there and other individuals from his staff. And we began the process of really what are the investments we're going to make in this area to attract people to not only these particular roles, but maybe also keep them in Connecticut. And yeah. Yeah. Um, it's something that I think we're excited about and energized about, but it's 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 a massive undertaking that a lot of companies and a lot of governments, local governments and a lot of universities need to collectively figure out how to attack. Right, right. And not everyone needs a university degree, right? I mean, and for, for these jobs. And so I'm assuming you have hundreds of job openings right now on your website, right? For for people to go take a look and and, and apply. So I, I know we do at Travelers. Thousands, Thousands. yeah. Thousands of openings, exactly. Yep. Um, okay, so let's shift a little bit. I have a couple of quick topics I want to hit on because they really are important and we get these these questions a lot at travelers. I want to talk about ESG, environmental, social and governance issues are really top of mind for a lot of CEOs these days. What are you seeing in the manufacturing world with regard to ESG? Yeah, I think you know, there's three areas that we've been trying to focus our energy on. We kicked off a really formal ESG strategy back in 2017. And um, our, our previous CEO, Jim Lurie, was, was a big, passionate um, supporter and advocate for that and um, created a lot of energy in our company around it. You know, because of some changes in the company and the portfolio of the company, we're actually going through a little bit of a rebate, rebaselining effort right now of, of basically rebasing, rebasing our goals for what we want to achieve by the end of this particular decade. Um, no major shift in the strategy overall. But it is focused in three different areas. And, and the first would be would be people. And so how do we empower people, empower makers, so that you know we help upscale individuals so they can have higher, achieve higher levels within their career? Um, how do we do some of the things I was just talking about that might get people more into the trades, more into the manufacturing industry that is going to be beneficial not only to our company, but be beneficial to our our economy here in the United States and other countries as well. The second pillar is product, which is how do we make our products more sustainable? And, and so we've, we've come up with a product recently in about the last two years called Reviva. And what it is, is it's a product that is under the Black & Decker brand that was made out of 
a significant portion was made out of basically old used water bottles. And so water bottles that were taken through a recycling process, and we were able to take a large component of that and use that as part of the tool. And it's a, it's a consumer tool. It's not a heavy duty construction power tool, but it's just, it's a consumer tool that anyone can use um, at home and, and what I would call light, you know, kind of do it yourself activities in your house or in your neighborhood. And there'll be more of those types of things happening over time as we continue to focus on how do we make our packaging sustainable? How do we make our products sustainable? Um, big effort in our company to reduce the amount of plastic in our packaging. And we've made great effort in that, a great um, achievements in that over the last three years, but we have more work to be done. And then the last area is just, you know, what do we can do, what we can do in other areas that reduce our carbon footprint. And so how do we, in our manufacturing processes, how do we get to basically a net zero impact? And then look at what our supply base does that feeds our manufacturing process and how do we get them to eventually get to a net zero carbon impact over time? That's a challenging journey. And I think we what we have in our control in the first kind of scope one is how that's referred to. Uh -huh. I think we'll be able to achieve that. When you get to the other scopes, which is in other companies that supply you, that takes that's probably a longer challenge that'll take some time. And we don't have all the answers. I mean, some of this is gonna have to be innovation that we don't know about that'll evolve in the next you know, decade. But those three areas are really where we're trying to focus our energy in ESG. And then clearly, you know, there's a diversity, equity, inclusion aspect that we have a lot of uh, effort and focus on as well. Actually, I wanna, I wanna move to that because um, I have a quote from you. Uh, you recently said, quote, diversity, equity, and inclusion are essential for achieving our vision, fulfilling our purpose, and being a sustainable company where the most talented people can thrive. So talk about your diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Yeah, I think, you know, diversity, um, equity, and inclusion has always been a big part of our culture. And, you know, we have definitely ramped up our efforts in this area over the last uh, probably decade or so. And I describe it as a, there's really, there's, there's never an end point to this. It's a journey that Learning. you're continuing to try to get better and better over time. And, and there's different metrics that you have to measure these things, such as, you know, gender diversity, um, ethnic diversity. And, you know, we've made nice progress. And we, today, you know, women make up about a third of our workforce. And that's great progress, but we want to be better. You know, we, we set a goal of 50-50 diversity related to gender. And um, we can get to that. It'll take time. But I think I do think it is achievable um, over a reasonable time horizon. But you're going to have to take, you have to approach things differently. And I think we've, we've embedded a lot of these things in our culture over the years where um, you do your best to create, every time you're hiring a role, in, whether it's internal or external, you do your best to make sure you're really creating diverse slates of candidates. And sometimes that can be challenging given the amount of information that can be shared through a process of gathering resumes and things like that. Um, so you do your best, but um, it also is about looking at some metrics and saying, well, what is our goal? You know, we're at one third gender diversity. We wanna to get to 50-50. So what's our goal in between? And how do we hold ourselves accountable to that? And if we're not on track, what are the things that are preventing us from achieving that? We've also put a lot of effort into, like most companies, into employee resource groups. And you know, we, we have a significant amount of groups, about 12 right now, that you know, a women's network. And you know, this month we're celebrating Women's History Month and uh, International Women's Day about a week and a half ago. Um, we have a an African-American ancestry group that, um, you know, we celebrated last month. And so we really try to take groups of people that fall into these different um, uh, pools of diversity and have them think about what can they do in Stanley Black & Decker that will help us on this journey and helps our company. Because we do believe, um, and you read the quote, diverse teams are better teams. Diverse teams are stronger teams. And if you look at the data, diverse teams actually perform better than non-diverse teams. 
That's correct. So if, if, if you're in a company, if it's about performance, then diversity has to be on your, on your agenda because ultimately a diverse team is going to perform better than a non-diverse team. Exactly. That, I mean, that's, the statistics have proven that out. And, and our CEO, Alan Schnitzer, talks about diversity as a business imperative, that it's not a nice to do, it's a must do. Mm -hmm. And so uh, alongside you, we, we, I think we have 10 or 12 employee resource groups. And uh, not only, I think we talk to people about, don't just join the one that you most closely okay. align to, but you know, we want lots of men in our women's network. We want that allyship. Because without allyship, we're just talking amongst ourselves. We okay. want others in the group. I'm a member of six or seven different diversity networks right now at Travelers, and I'm an ally to all of them. And I think encouraging people to get a little bit out of their comfort zone and be an ally for a group that you, they might not might not look like them is really, really also uh, encouraging of, of the culture. I, I want to talk about your culture because... Uh, I've read Forbes has named your company one of the best in in the world for employees. Fortune has also called uh, Stanley Black and Dark one of the most admired companies. So I've heard about your culture. Obviously, I'm in Hartford a lot and um, know a lot of folks who work there. Uh, what is this special secret sauce that you guys have to, you have a lot, your retention is very high as, as well for your employees. What is your culture? How can you describe your culture for us? Yeah, I think that you know the culture is built on a lot of um, high level of respect for each other, a uh, high level of teamwork. Um, we really do. We really try to use the word "we" versus "I." Um, obviously, obviously, the word "I" has a place in the narrative in, in certain settings, but it really is about a team, and there is no one person that makes Stanley Black and Decker successful. Um, it's a team of people, fifty-five plus thousand. Mm -hmm employees that that make our company the success that it's been. And, and, and more importantly, it makes the company capable of navigating challenging times. I mean, we, we're we dealing with a challenging time right now. We've dealt with three years of challenging times in the pandemic. And it's, the, it's this culture that actually helps us navigate through it. And it goes back to that level of respect that we're all part of a team. This is, we believe in learning, but the way that we learn is we don't go, we don't embarrass people when they make a mistake. Because sometimes folks unknowingly say in a public setting, okay, well, well, you know, Joe, what did you learn from this experience? You know, what what did we what did you do wrong or what did what did the team do wrong? Share that with the rest of the you know team or the organization. The intention of that's very good, but actually you make that person and that team feel horrible when you do yeah. that versus you know if something happens you don't dwell on if somebody made a mistake you just look at the facts and what are the facts so we thought when we put this together this plan together we thought we'd get to here and we we only got to here okay well what are the facts that are supporting or saying that that happened okay well well that means we should have we should do this going forward we should do that going forward and you focus more on the discussion of what you do before and you, do, you focus less on, quote unquote, what were the bad decisions that were made? Yeah. And that's not a, a, always easy for people to do, but the more you get into the habit of doing it, the more it becomes part of your DNA. And then the last thing I'd say about the culture is, is people do, they, they quote unquote, trust the system, which is, you know, we have a system of, of trying to develop people. We have a system of communicating and being transparent. We have annual reviews, we have merit programs, we have bonus programs. Um, we have career paths for individuals. And sometimes I'll use myself as an example. I can look back at my career and say, there was a point, there were a couple of points in time where I was sitting there saying, why am I still in this job? Why have I not gotten promoted to the next job? And I'm getting frustrated because I'm ready for the next job and I'm not getting promoted. And I got a lot of good mentorship along the way saying, yeah, you're right, but just trust the system. People know that, people understand it. Sometimes it, it takes an extra two months or so or three months before it happens. And I think there's a lot of people that understand that in our company that, and they don't make it personal, they make it more about the team and, and how the team can be successful. And then I, you know, I always say that what's a deep, deep 
embedded in this culture that has been there for hundreds of years is that we've always had great people. We've always had great brands and we've always had a great innovation machine. And when you have those three things as a foundation that you can build a culture on top of, you know, it, it, in some ways it does make it easier to build a really solid culture that helps you navigate these types of challenging times. And culture is not something you, you think about and focus on a lot when things are going really well. Yeah. When things are going bad, then you really have to, you have to lean on that culture to help you get through it. That's and, right navigate it. Well, that was really well said. And it's very, very similar to all culture, which we use the word collaboration. It's uh, it's a very big word around here. And um, so thank you for that. Sure. I, I want to kind of pivot to our last segment uh, before we get to audience questions, which is technology and innovation, and then talk about some of your products. Um, so first, let's talk about how technology has really changed the manufacturing sector. You mentioned AI, uh, you know, are you using chat GPT? Uh, this innovation is coming at us so fast uh, with artificial intelligence. Tell us what you're seeing, and then we're going to go right into your products. Yeah, in the manufacturing space, I mean, it's it's evolving very quickly, the amount of technology that's impacting manufacturing, which is actually going to be beneficial as we try to move our manufacturing closer to our customers, as I described earlier. The level of robotic automation is, has changed a lot in the last 10 years. And so you can actually have robots that do partial assembly activities in a manufacturing plant right next to a human being. And, and so you can be on an assembly line and, you know, a power tool is being put together and it, it's going to be a mix of robotics and individuals. That's going to continue to improve and evolve. But what's also happening at the same time is the amount of data and information that you get off a manufacturing production line has increased dramatically in the last decade or two. And so now when you're running a plant, the leaders of a plant, they're looking at data on a board live that's actually happening related to a multiple set of production lines. And, and they can see, okay, well, that, that production line is, is behind schedule. What's happening there? And they can analyze the data and try to understand. And then there's predictive analytics, which is taking that data and as you build the history of the data over time, you can begin to predict what might happen on a production line when you might have a failure with a machine and you actually predict that that's going to happen. And so we're just, we're, we're tipping the iceberg on that piece. We don't, I wouldn't say that we're heavily into that yet because we're probably, in, we're in the robotic stage and we're in the data collection stage. That predictive piece is next where we would go, which obviously allows you to evolve to artificial intelligence, which you really start to get to a point where the computer is starting to recommend decisions that a leader can look at and say, uh, I agree with that, or I don't agree with that. And we're not there yet, but that's kind of the evolution of where manufacturing is going. And I think there's, there's companies that are further along in that journey than we are. There's, there's certain German companies that are kind of at the end of that spectrum and really highly automated using artificial intelligence data to help make decisions in the plant. But it's exciting where that's going. But what we realize is that it doesn't make people go away. It just changes their jobs. Yes. And so we have to be retraining them as these changes are happening so that they can, maybe before they, as a supervisor of a line, they were more hands-on helping figure out how to produce something where now they have to be more data focused in analyzing data and so we have to give them the skills and the training so they can actually do that. Great. I want to get into your products now because uh, last year alone, you launched 1,000 new products. Fast Company has called your company among the best places to work for innovators. How do you keep ahead of this innovation curve? Uh, how do you know what the customer is going to want next before they even know it? As Steve Jobs said, they don't even know what they want next and I'm going to build it for them. But talk to us about a company that launches a thousand new products every year. That's really, that's a lot of, that's a lot of, that's a lot of innovation. Yeah. When I, um, when I came to Stanley 24 years ago, I never would have guessed innovation was such a big part of a tool company. Um, Cause you know, if you're somebody that, 
uses screwdrivers, hammers, drills, um, saws, um, miter saws. You probably don't think there's a lot of innovation in that, that it's something that was created decades ago and that's about it. But actually in this particular industry, innovation is a big part of the business model. And there's, two, there's really three different types of innovation. There's what we call core incremental innovation, which is just making the product a little bit better. And so adding a little bit of functionality that basically achieves a couple of objectives. One, it makes the, the user of the tool more effective in, the, in, in their job, like a professional construction worker, that you know, for a nailing gun, you know, maybe they can now put nails in a roof at a pace that's you know 20% more than the previous version of the tool. And then the second thing is the wear and tear on the user. So as a professional, I'm sure some of you have worked in a professional construction job. I did it way back in the day when I was in college. And using using tools all day long really does wear on your your muscles and your body all day. And the more vibration you have in the tool, the more you feel that over time. And so to minimize the amount of vibration in a power tool is incredibly important. Um, then there's other things like how do you enhance battery life on a cordless power tools so that it can use it longer and before it has to be recharged. And then there's the second category, which we call breakthrough, which is really looking at something new to the world, the Steve Jobs type thing that is kind of like, you know, what people don't even know they need this. And how do you introduce something like that? And, and, and a good example of that for us was that we um, introduced a set of products under the Dwell brand called Flex Bolt. And what it is, is it's a battery pack and a set of tools that can flip between a 60 volt battery tool to a 20 volt. And so we have different tools that run on 20 volt battery packs and different tools that run on 60 volt battery packs. Obviously the bigger, the bigger tools are 60 volt. And one battery that actually can go in either one of those tools and when it snaps in, it knows it's 20 volt or it knows it's 60 volt. And that was a breakthrough innovation that the professional construction industry just has loved. And it's created close to seven, $800 million of annual revenue for us since we launched that about five or six years ago. Well, and it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be over a billion dollars probably three or four years from now. And then the last category is just pie in the sky innovation. Just thinking about like where the construction industry might go in the future with 3D printing, and um, other types of construction technology that will make the industry much more efficient and effective. And, and what is the role of Stanley Black & Decker in that? Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanna go to some audience questions now. First, a couple comments. Um, one person weighs in and says, uh, your products are incredibly reliable. I absolutely love my under the counter can opener, which has lasted now more than 12 years. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for that. Um, you know, look, Don, let's get personal. What is your favorite tool? I mean, do you have a garage full of tools and do you use, do you have time to use them? And are you a handyman? Uh, give us your, uh, what's your favorites? I, I know this is gonna be disappointing, but I am not a handyman. Um, However, I do know how to use I do know how to use the tools and I do know how to do certain things. It's just not it's not my passion on the weekend. Um, but that being said, I do have a garage full of tools. But I, I think probably my neighbors use the tools more than I do. But that's okay. <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, I want to be your neighbor. <laughs> but um, my favorite tool though is their flexible that flexible technology. We have a tool that's a chainsaw. And it's a, a reasonable size chainsaw. It's not, it's not a real large chainsaw. It's a good size that anybody can use. And I have to say, when, when I get it out to like do something in the yard with it, I'm suddenly looking for more things to cut up because I love the tool and I, I really, I use it as much as I can. So that's, that's probably my favorite tool. I have to say my husband has several chainsaws and is also looking for things to cut up in the yard a lot. Um, okay, another question coming in from the audience. Uh, what's the next new thing for Stanley Black & Decker? Obviously, we're not going to give any proprietary secrets away, but uh, what is is there something new coming down the pike that we can you can kind of give us a sneak peek at? Well, I think the, the next really big thing for us and the innovation front 
if you, if you look at the products behind me in the background, this is in a Home Depot store. And those are large, um, obviously, lawn mowing set of machines. And so the one to this, this side over here, this is a basically a zero turn mower. And so it has the capability of, of doing a 180 degree turn right on a, on a dime. And these are all gas propelled today. But this, this industry is, is quickly changing to battery power technology, which is great for the environment. Um, it's amazing how, how much pollution a small gas engine puts into our environment. Um, it's actually, in many cases, worse than today's cars because so much work has been done to make our cars more efficient from a, um, an oil combustion point of view. Uh, over the last two two decades, that's not true necessarily with these types of engines. So um, we have we now have battery solutions and walk behind mowers. So the ones you kind of walk behind in your yard, we have battery solutions for ride on mowers, um, and then we're going to have solutions in this space probably in the next three years that'll be battery operated, uh, which is incredibly exciting. I just think it's a it's a great positive product for the environment, but also it's going to be higher levels of functionality. It'll be quieter. I mean, how many times have all of you sat out in your back porch and somebody's using some loud blowing machine and or mower? And the great thing about the electric battery operated versions, they're dramatically lower in noise and much quieter. That's great. That's great. Um, and then another comment coming in from our audience and just a suggestion, and I actually have to agree with this woman, I'm not going to name her name, but she says she's very petite, as am I, um, I'm short, um, yeah. and my hands are small. And as you said, if you're using a power tool for a long time, you, you get tired. And I pick up my husband's drill and it's so huge. Have you ever considered making a line of products for women, honestly, because I honestly... <laughs> I would buy a drill if it was made like a, for a petite hand, or is that market so small that women just don't want to be bothered and you won't look at it. But anyway, well, just, just a suggestion for one of my it's audience. A, it's a great suggestion that we've actually looked at over the years and we have not come up with a perfect solution yet. We okay. do have smaller versions of our DeWalt brand that are much smaller tools that actually are good. I actually don't have a big hand either. I have a small hand. So um some of the bigger tools are really hard to hold for long periods of time, but there yeah. are smaller versions of the Walt that you can get both in Lowe's and Home Depot. Oh, really? Okay. Well, I'm going to get back to this lady who asked this question and she can go look for the smaller version. Is that, is there a brand name on it or it's is it just, the, yeah, it's called the Walt atomic in Home Depot and it's called the Walt extreme in uh, Lowe's. Oh, fantastic. See, so you do have a solution. Fantastic. Um, and then last question coming in on your, you know, your blender, you have something new out there for making cocktails. I mean, tell us about this thing. Yeah, we, um, it was like three years ago, we, we were working with a, uh, a joint venture startup company that had basically developed this, this machine, which is like a Keurig machine that makes cocktails. So you little, you put a little pot in there, and then you have four cylinders of four different types of alcohol, depending on what types of drinks you want. And you put that in there and you put your ice in your glass and you put it underneath just like a curd machine and it'll make a cocktail for you. Um, Perfect. And so we have a new cordless version now, which is run on a battery pack versus um, plugged into an ele electronic outlet. But um, yeah, it's an exciting, it's a great thing. It's a great party topic set of machine to have if you're having a party at your house people just love it awesome awesome a conversation starter all right i'm gonna get myself one of those for sure don listen uh the hour has just flown by and you've just been incredibly generous with your time your thoughts and i i like how you talk about your leadership style just stick to the facts no drama and it was really it was just refreshing be a listener i mean there's so many lessons learned i think in leadership as well as all the uh, other things we learned about your company. So again, thank you so much. And also I want to thank you for being such a community leader in Connecticut. I know you do a lot of charitable work uh, around town and it's not uh, gone unrecognized. You're, you're a leader in that space too. And also a big champion for the state of Connecticut um, to thrive. So thank you so much. Keep doing what you're doing. Come back anytime. We'd love to have you. And uh, again, thanks. I'm going to let you go and I'm going to talk about our next upcoming programs. I know you're a busy guy. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, everybody.
All righty. So folks also fill out our survey. It's in the, uh, the, the chat feature there uh, about today's program. Uh, upcoming next week on March 29th, a conversation about workers' compensation. So all my friends in business insurance, you do not want to miss this. Uh, and the workforce well-being, total worker health. Uh, we have an out renowned expert from the CDC with us, Dr. Uh, Casey Chosewood. Uh, and then our very own travelers, Alan McAllister, is going to talk about uh, containing workers' compensation cost. Uh, April 5th, we're going to do a deep dive into the trends in personal, I'm sorry, professional and financial lines of insurance. Given what we've seen over the last few weeks with some of the banking issues out there and financial lines, we're going to talk about that. So tune in then. Uh, then on April 26th, we're going to drill down on a report about the economic value of construction surety bonds. So we're going to pivot between uh, some of uh, just general interest, and we're going to deep dive into the insurance space in the next month. So uh, please join us. We're thrilled to have you and uh, send us your recommendations for upcoming topics. We love to hear all the comments. And of course, uh, check out travelersinstitute.org for replays of sessions like today. So be well, my friends, and we'll see you next week.